Pandeham Shri Guru Shri Ataf Padakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnava Angsta Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shivishakhan Vitamscha Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Continuing from yesterday, the discussion of the history of ISKCON, especially in America, summarizing quite a few years into just a few minutes. And the effects that had on the movement and some of the reasons as to why the movement is as it is now, some of the historical background. Now, one major factor, which I didn't touch on at all yesterday, was the anti-cult movement. <clears throat> one <clears throat> feature of the counterculture, which was the, the counterculture more or less meant the hippie movement. With, there was... Uh, in the hippie movement, one of the major factors was the search for the truth. In various levels of sincerity, but there was definitely a major factor in it, and especially a, a, a looking towards what could be called Eastern religions and Eastern mysticism. <laughs> and also... There were gurus coming from India, to America especially. Uh, and th three of them became prominent, as, as, as I see it. There were, there were quite a few who came, but three became prominent. Um, this Mahesh Yogi, the, this trans, so-called Transcendental Meditation founder, uh, he probably got the most followers. Um, if you can call them followers at all, because it's not, he, he deliberately presented it as not being religious. He insisted it's not religious. It's just a technique for, for uh, living in this world in a better way. Uh, and by this non, absolutely non-sectarian and non-religious approach, he, to a large extent, avoided the kinds of problems that others uh, ran into, including ISKCON, because he didn't take people out of their day-to-day -day lives. They remained in their day-to-day -day lives. He didn't tell people to stop living as regular Americans, and even his techniques became incorporated in the U.S. Army, uh, like that, but it's... Um, then another was the so-called Guru Maharaji, also known as uh, Bal Yogeshwar, who's a young boy who presented himself as being God, and he got many followers. Um, and another was the, uh, the Hare Krishna movement, the followers of Srila Prabhupada. There were others also, there were, Meha Baba was already dead, but there were his followers going on. And um, there, there were also the children of God or the Jesus freaks who were, who were uh, a Christian kind of cult. <laughs> that was more acceptable to mainstream America. And the influence is still going on. It's, it's said to have influenced the turn toward right-wing 
politics of the evangelical Christians, which is a major cultural and political factor in America at this time. So anyway, in the 1970s, what was happening, um, there was a lot of concern in America especially, more than in other countries, because it was in other countries also, but it was more pronounced in America. And Americans, um, for all their talks of liberty, they, they, they came for liberty, right, to America, Statue of Liberty, to have religious liberty. That's how modern America was founded, with the Plymouth Fathers fleeing religious persecution in Europe. People came to America, but they themselves were very illiberal, for instance, uh, or most grossly toward the black people. Uh, toward the what they call the Red Indians. And then when waves of Catholics started to come in, they were very illiberal toward them also. Irish Catholics, Polish Catholics, and so on. So, although in other countries there was no anti-cult movement, just like in Britain, the Hare Krishna movement, also it made a big splash. In other words, it became well known. Uh, but there was no anti-cult movement there. But it, that happened in uh, America, that people became very upset that their children uh, were joining cults. Oh, another one was the Moonies, but he wasn't an Indian guru. He was from Korea. He claimed himself to be an incarnation of Jesus, and he got many followers also. Uh, so there were these various cults what they were called cults. And, uh, and mainstream America, not everyone. There were people who were very favorable or open-minded also. Um, but the, there was a major cult scare that these people, they're taking our children. They don't, our children, uh, they become lost to us. They don't want to have anything to do with their families. In many cases, that was true in the case of Iskon, but it, it, it may be the other side also in many cases that the, that the parents were also trying to force the children to, to be normal Americans, whatever that means. <laughs> um, so it, it's a complex tapestry. It's, uh, the, the, every case is different. So I'm just giving generalizations here, but there was a pronounced anti-cult movement and there were books written and TV programs made and it, there was some, what was that, TV program or something saying, bring our, ch save our children, bring our children back. There was the American Save Our Families Society or something like this. Um, now one thing which really exacerbated the whole anti-cult movement was a Christian cult from America nominally Christian. It was led by someone who we could safely, in medical terms, say was a madman, uh, Jim Jones, who f took his followers mostly from California, where else in America? If you want anything really wacko, it's either New York or California. Uh, New York City, to be more precise. Ah. Uh, uh, so he took his followers, who are mostly from California, to Guyana, which is a small country where English is spoken in South America. There are not many places in South America where English is the main language. Guyana is one of them. And he founded a commune there. And anyway, to make a long story short, in November in 1978, he and his followers entered a suicide pact they all decided to commit, well, he told them to commit suicide. Um, just shortly to that, an American congressman had visited them and got shot dead. So they were, ex they were expecting some blowback from that. And they all killed themselves. Very few escaped. Uh, and there were 900 and something Americans dead. And that created a big stir that 900 Americans had taken their life at the word of 
a cult leader. So that made it seem very dangerous that that uh, people, they can just, these cult leaders are very dangerous because just on their word, all their followers will die. Uh, there was also, I'm not sure which year, what that was, Charles Manson. He, he was a leader of a very small cult in California. <laughs> very small cunt, cult, sorry. Um, but he, uh, they kidnapped some, the wife of Roman Polanski, who was a film, famous film director, and ritually murdered her. They didn't just murder her, they ritually murdered her. And, and, and like some kind of cult rite. And apparently they were chanting Hare Krishna as they did it. I, I've heard that, I'm not sure if they did or not. Uh, so Charles Manson, the name is still famous in America to the present day. About two years ago, he tried to get parole. He, he came up for parole and there was a massive uh, negative reaction from the American public, those who remembered him. Uh, there was another one, again, I don't remember the year, I should have checked it out before. Patty Hearst was the daughter of a, uh, a, a big, rich, famous newspaper magnate. She was kidnapped by some cult and uh, and then she became one of them. Uh, she she uh, joined in their terroristic activities. In Germany, though, that was something a little different. That was in the 1970s also, the Bader Meinhof gang. You heard of that? They, they, were, they, were Euro they were Germans and they were terrorists and they were trying to overthrow the system by terrorism, uh, killing people and this and that. That was a little different. So... Uh, there were, people became very scared of cults and it was whipped up in the news that these cults are very dangerous. Of course, Jesus himself, he, uh, he brainwashed people also, right? There were, he had 12 apostles, most of them are fishermen previously. He, told, he just came up to them and said, now leave your nets, come and follow me. And said, who will feed our families? Do the birds not eat? So Jesus also brainwashed people and took them away from their families, uh, left, left their, fa their families. But at least he didn't, uh, he didn't have people go around killing others. So, uh, yeah, this Jonestown thing was a very, very big thing. Uh, it, it, massive news all over the world. And in America, a Gallup poll was taken in America shortly after that event, and 98% of Americans had heard of the Jonestown events, which was far more than, than normal. If there is some big event goes on in America, because the Gallup poll, that's what they do. They regularly make polls. And... Uh, even there, there may be a, a president elected, a new change of election, but it's not that everyone knows. That there may, 98% was a phenomenally high number of people that had heard of the, what they call the Jonestown Massacre. Actually, it was, a, it was a joint suicide, but they didn't really have that much choice. They, they or rather, it was, <laughs> we were talking about euthanasia yesterday. They got injected with the, and that, that term has entered the, uh, the, at least the American vocabulary, Kool-Aid, because they, they had to drink something with poison or they were injected with some poison, which was called Kool-Aid or something like that. So, uh, people felt very threatened by these cults. And when people are threatened, what do they do? They run away, they try to hide, or they respond with more violence or more pressure. 
So the American response was they weren't going to run away. Where are they going to run away to? Uh, but and they didn't. They didn't respond with violence exactly, but they, they, there was a lot of pressure, legal pressure and uh, social pressure and all kinds of things on these cults. And naturally, the Hare Krishna movement got lumped in. That was the, that was the term. We, we, we or our devotees used to say, don't lump us in. We're not the same. We, we, our, our devotees made a uh, a very a, a lot of propaganda, or trying to trying to speak with people. There'd be TV interviews, and trying to say that we're not the same. Now we stood out as a, generally when just like in Time magazine and Newsweek magazine and Life magazine, they would there were lots of reports about cults, and usually they'd show the devotees, even though in in as their main photo on the front page when they were doing a major article on cults. They'd show the devotees, even though the devotees were much less in number than the followers of Mahesh Yogi or even of this Bal Yogeshwar, Guru Maharaji, they called him. Uh, much less in number, but we were much more visible because we went out on the streets chanting with our, with our colored robes and shaved heads and... The, and uh, we were, we, we were very, uh, clearly, we were very different to the American mainstream. And actually going out in the streets chanting Hare Krishna, it is uh, indirectly a statement that we're not part of your society and we don't want to be part of it and we've got something else and we're, we're bringing it to you, like it or not. So doing Hari Nam is, it's not directly aggressive, but it may be seen as that. And that's why we see, maybe you don't see in Croatia much, especially these days, but uh, some people they see are chanting, although it's not doing them any harm, but they become very angry and even violent. Some years ago in Sarajevo, then the devotees doing Harinam and they were severely attacked and some were almost killed, right? Hmm? Stabbed, yeah. Were there any prosecutions? I think not. Hmm? Probably not. Probably the police might have supported them at that time. Hmm? Hmm? Oh, the main attackers were killed by the devotees? No, by another gang. By another gang. They saw them attacking the devotees and they attacked them. Oh, a few years later, the uh, the main attackers, who are gang members, they got killed by another gang, yeah. By other gang. Okay, I didn't know that. Uh, now, the devotees, they, they were trying to go to the press and say, actually, we're good, we're not bad. In 1977, the, the, the New York Supreme Court, that means the state of New York, Supreme Court, or was it the National Supreme Court? I, can't, I, I believe it's New York State Supreme Court, because they have, in each state they have a Supreme Court, then they have a federal Supreme Court. So they, a, a, a decision was handed down in, in a major case of brainwashing against uh, the devotees that, um, <laughs> that a Hare Krishna movement is a bona fide religion with roots in India going back thousands of years. So that was a major victory because, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, the, the general charge was brainwashing. They're brainwashing, although such, uh, and the, uh, th there were groups of concerned parents who organized themselves, for the parents of ch children, it means they're all grown up, mostly. They're, they're ab above the age of, consent or they're, they're the age where they're allowed they are considered an adult by law but still the parents were saying our oh, children we have to bring them back they're being misled and there were charges of brainwashing and the the uh, anti-cult movements would would uh, bring their expert witnesses some psych psychologists who uh, even though the uh, even though in standard orthodox psychology the very concept of brainwashing had been refuted, that there is no such thing as brainwashing. 
<laughs> that you can't actually brainwash someone. But they, they still made that propaganda. And then there were those who were, they, they, there were scholars actually who were very supportive of, of, uh, of the devotees. So it was, it was, it was a big thing. Now the devotees and the other groups also. <clears throat> now, uh, yeah, there were many legal battles. Now, it, it's like I say, it's a complex tapestry because the devotees also did things which uh, really upset the public. And the main thing was um, distributing books in the airports really upset the airport authorities, but the devotees won court cases based on the First Amendment of the American Constitution that you can assemble in public places for propagating a religion. So they managed to win that. And But there were so many court cases going on which were taking up a lot of money and energy of the devotees. But the people didn't really didn't like that. And they, they what they... Well, because the devotees, it was a hard sell, the way they'd sell the books. It was really a forceful way of selling. And then what happened, devotees, this was going on, I believe, even when Prabhupada was present. They, they, the change up, they discovered the change up, the system of change up, that they'd give people a book and say, hey, we're look, we're, uh, they'd also tell white lies or, or lies, well, they weren't exactly, they weren't totally false, but they weren't exactly true. They'd say, we're helping a lot of kids get off drugs give some donation, or we're feeding people in Bangladesh, or whatever, give some donation. So it wasn't totally untrue, but it wasn't the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So people didn't like that, but what really uh, upset people uh, on increasingly, more and more, there was an anger building up among people in, the people who frequented the airports, which at that time was mostly business and well-to-do people. Nowadays, air travel has become common for pretty much everyone, but uh, in those days, it was mostly business and wealthy people. The jet set, they flew. So these were the influential people in America, and they were getting hit up time and time again. In one airport, they flew from, and then when they landed, they get hit up again like that and they're frequently flying, so... But, the, um, but what happened was uh, the devotees, they discovered this technique of making much more money. What it was, was that um, they tell me we're helping, can you help out? And say someone, someone gives a... Uh, they, they pull out a $10 bill and say, okay, I'll give $3. You give me... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, no, wait a minute. Or they may give they may give three dollars or something like that. One, two, three, three notes, three bills, as they say in America. And then the devotees would say, uh, "Hey, look, I got a lot of change already. Could you give me a bigger note and I'll give you change?" So okay, they pull out a ten dollar bill or a twenty dollar bill, and the devotees say, "The bigger, the better." And then the devotee would give them. Ones, one, two, three, four, counting stuff. Say, hey, a lot of people are giving six dollars here. Could could you do also? And they just kind of, oh, oh, okay, all right. And then they realize when they walk away, hey, I didn't want to give six dollars. I don't want to give three dollars. And then if they pull out a fifty, and then they give them five, ten, fifteen, twenty, and they stop at twenty-five, and then the, pe the people felt cheated. And although all the money was going for Krishna's service, it really upset people a lot. And another thing that upset people, maybe not to the same extent, but it became well known that our devotees, they would, at the Christmas season, they would dress as Santa Claus and uh, get donations from people. Are you looking at him? He'd make a good Santa. He's got a big round face. Already said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Just listen in here. <laughs> so uh, they dress as Santa Claus and take donations because, because so many charities, they would have people dress as Santa Claus and then they take donations. So our devotees did it also. 
and they'd give people books. So people also became miffed by that because they thought, hey, this Santa Claus thing, it's, it's, a, it's part of the Christian celebration. Although most people, when they see Santa Claus, they don't think anything about Christ or Christianity, but it's, it's part of the Christmas celebration, which is supposed to be Christian. And again, it's a kind of cheating because they think they're giving to help something, anything, but not Hare Krishna. So they became peed off by this. So, so devotees weren't helping themselves by doing this, these kind of things. They, they might have got away with it better if they had not done these things. Now, um, talking about brainwashing, well, there was the, the anti-cult movement, there was the, anti, the, the antidote for brainwashing was discovered by Ted Patrick, who is an anti-deprogrammer. By the way, what's it called? No, a deprogrammer. He was a deprogrammer. We were, we were anti-deprogrammers. So the idea that children have been programmed, in, they're not in their proper state of mind, so the, 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 the Ted Patrick and his cohorts, they would kidnap uh, a child, not children, I mean the, the child, yeah, everyone's a child, even a 90-year-old man is he's the child of his dead father. But uh, they'd kidnap the young, a, a certain young person, and they would then they would deprogram him. They'd take him to a locked house and shout at him, yell at him, deprive him of sleep. Um, if they try to chant Hare Krishna, they might put ice in their mouth and and all kinds of things. Really horrible treatment, totally illegal. Um, <laughs> who who did they know how to choose? Did they take people at random? No. They would, they would deprogram people at the behest of their parents for a moderate sum of $10,000 or so in those days, which is even a lot more than, even today it's not a small sum of money. Uh, so this was going on and if the devotees complained to the police, the police in most cases wouldn't do anything. They'd think, good. Good, they think yeah. uh, they were on the side of the deprogrammers. Eventually, Ted Patrick got put in prison, but he'd done quite a lot of damage like that. So devotees were, at, at any time, they could be just kidnapped. He was actually kidnapping and taken away. Uh, now, the devotees, in order to, to survive all of this, they try, they took the they took legal help, and they took help from the American Civil Liberties Union, which is a powerful group which, uh, which stands up for the liberties of people who are, especially people who are being oppressed or mistreated by the uh, American government or legal authorities or whoever. They, they, they have a team of lawyers, and in various ways, they try to help out people who are being oppressed. Um, so we, we took, they were very helpful in various ways. The only thing is that they also supported uh, the rights of black people, we don't have a problem with that, but the rights of gays and feminism and this and that. So it, it really, taking their help really compromised our, our ability, or what's the word, our our moral right to to say that well we we don't support homosexuality we we nowadays if you ask devotees they'll say well, well they may say well we don't support it and we're not against it but actually we are against it <laughs> if you see Prabhupada's books we're, we're not going to burn them or shoot them or kill them, but we, we, we are definitely not in favor of homosexuality. Uh, we're not neutral. If we see the Prabhupada's teachings, we shouldn't be neutral and we shouldn't be pro-gay. But anyway, it, it compromised our, our uh, 
right or our, our position because if we're taking help from people who also support things that we don't believe in, then it becomes a case of strange bedfellows, as they call it. Now, oh, another major thing I should have said around the other, I, I should have said before, before I brought that in, was the, uh, the Robin George case, which was a major factor in ISKCON in America in 1990, no, sorry, 1974, a, a young girl, Robin George, her name, she was 15 years old. She ran away from home and joined the devotees. Uh, in 1976, she went back, but in the meantime, to her parents. But in the meantime, the devotees had hidden her in various locations, uh, lied to the parents where she is, deliberately hidden her. It was technically, it could be called equal to a kidnap because she was underage, and it could be said that she was. Um, she she, yeah, she was being held illegally, for sure. Um, 76, she went back or whatever. Anyway, then the, the parents made a... What happened, her father died of a heart attack shortly after she went back home, and it, that was blamed by herself and her mother on the all the stress from the tussle with the devotees, although he had had heart attacks previously also. So he came to court and there, there was a lawyer, Turley, you're still in Dallas, if you, Dallas City in Texas. Um, we go on Harinam in the park sometimes and you can see downtown among the many uh, high-rise buildings is that of Turley and Associates, a legal company who they specialize in suing cases. So the, the suing was for the, the, these two, Marcia George and her daughter Robin George, sued the devotees for $32 million, which the devotees don't have that kind of money, anything like that. So that was a very big thing. Then the judge, uh, the first trial, I may not be getting the facts exactly right here, but anyway, you get. The, I'm giving the general idea. The first judge said, "No, she. It can't be said she was held against her will. It can't be." Cause. Then he massively reduced the, the, uh, the damages that they were suing for. But the, but they, uh, but they took it again. To see the Turley Turley takes up these cases with the idea that he'll get a cut from the damages. So they try to make the damages as high as possible. And then Turley takes, uh, Turley and Associates takes a huge proportion of it. And they became very rich by suing culture. Uh, now in the state of California, if, if in comparison, if, if someone lured a child, say a 15 year old girl, as that was the age of Robin George when she joined ISKCON. In California, if she'd been lured into prostitution, child prostitution, then the, the maximum penalty would be something like a $4,000 fine and maybe a few months in jail. And they, they wanted to put $32 million. It was called punitive damages. The idea is to teach those people a lesson that we're not just get, we, we're not making these damages just to uh, just to recompense the poor parent and the poor child for their for their pain and their suffering, but also we want to we want to we want to smash that cult there. Uh, that they should be punitive means there's a punishment. They should be punished by giving such heavy. A heavy fine. Now, if they were to pay 32 million, uh, to even stand in court, the devotees had to attach various temples as a, as a I don't, can't remember the legal term. Uh, that means if they lose the case and they get the fine, then they're going to have to sell those temples and 
to, to pay the fine. But even if they sold all the temples in America, I don't know if it would. Nowadays, it would come easily to 32 million, but in those days, it wouldn't. So it was actually a roundabout way of trying to smash the whole movement. And the devotees in America, they spent years and years fighting this case. It wasn't. It was eventually settled out of court in 1995 for we don't know how much money. It wasn't revealed. But the devotees spent years and years. And then you have the leaders, the, the leaders in America, the top leaders, their energy went into this. So it wasn't being put into preaching. We can say, oh, what happened to the preaching? Well, this is one of the things that happened. In the meantime, as I said yesterday, the, the hippie movement was over, to, a, to a large extent over, and the yuppie movement, highly materialistic. The pendulum swung the other way. The yuppie movement came up. So people weren't joining. The devotees were in so much anxiety, uh, and it took a toll on them also. Um, in the meantime, the, 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 the gurus were falling down and there were so many uh, angry devotees that you cheated us by saying that these gurus are pure devotees. So in, in various ways, it was a very stressful time and they felt like they had Damocles' sword hanging over their head any time the sword can fall and then we, a whole movement will be finished. They didn't know. It was a very, very tense time for years and years and years. And what happened was, although it, that, that finally came to, the, the Robin George case was closed in 1995, still the devotees had to pay a lot of money, even from India. Well, they didn't exactly send money, but the, the money that would have gone to India for building Mayapur, instead it went there. So it went instead to pay the Robin George case and this and that. So in various ways, it was a great financial strain, how to get the money to, to fight these court cases, because it costs a huge amount of money. Just lawyers in America, it, it's just like if you go, to the, you go to a dentist in America, if you even look them in the face, it costs $1,000, literally. If you just, you can, just to, just to get a checkup. It's crazy. Medicine and law in America, it's, it's just, uh, you're, you're finished. You're, 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 uh, so uh, these, the, these were various factors, and eventually when it was all over, what had happened, it missed a whole generation of preaching. And again, I'm generalizing. But, uh, so even if the devotees, if they, if they had any spirit left, and God bless them, Krishna bless them, that they had some spirit left after all of that, they, they didn't get totally drained. They may have felt like that, but they, they, they kept on going. But in the meantime, the devotees had become older, and who's going to preach to the young people? Just like they, when they were young, they couldn't relate to their, to the, their parents, which is one their older generation, which is one reason they joined the Hare Krishna movement. But they also are out of touch with the next generation, or maybe two generations, because they change us so quickly. And so these are some of the factors in the uh, decline of the Hare Krishna movement. Uh, by, by, we were trying to present ourselves as not a cult, we're not antisocial, we're pro-family, uh, we, we respect all religions, we go to interfaith conferences just to show how we respect all religions and have people from other religions speak favorably of us. When we meet people, don't try to preach to them, just be nice to them. Hello, how are you doing? Have a good day. Like this kind of thing because they don't want to show themselves to be fanatics. So these are some of the points, and I'll uh, yeah, I'll leave it there for now and continue. Later, maybe, maybe one more session, maybe two. It's not very inspiring, but it's interesting. <laughs> we can take inspiration also that through so many difficulties, the phoenix can arise from the ashes. Krishna is more than any phoenix. 
Hare Krishna, Vancha Kalpa, Tarupyas, Charki Pass, and Dubi Avichapaditanam Pavanabhyo. Vaishnavabhyo, Namo Namaha.